our exhibition over in the Macriani Swing begins with a quote, stranger, in this land of horses, you have come to Earth's fairest home, meaning Athens. Athens is no longer home to very many horses, but there is this one carriage horse left uh, who grazes down by the Penix, and I thank Robert McCabe for photographing him for us. Um, but back in its early days, from its earliest days, Athens had horses, beautiful, noble animals that were part of the daily life of the city. And this is what we have tried to bring to life in our exhibition, which you will see um, after the lecture or come back at another time, given the fact that we have to limit entrance to about 12 people at a time. There you see the Macriani swing, and there you see the reason for the exhibition. Six or seven years ago, I was very impressed with the excavations down at Falaron conducted by Dr. Stella Krisolaki and her team. Among the thousand and some human burials, um, they excavated at that time eight horses. All this material came to the Wiener Laboratory for Archaeological Science, which is on the other side of the street here, and has been the subject of ongoing research. We were lucky to have on the staff uh, a very talented zooarchaeologist, Dr. Flint Dibble, you will hear from him later, um, who studied the animal bones. And as you can see from this layout in the exhibition, they're in beautiful condition. And I, at that time, said, you know, we should really have a show now that we have an exhibition space that features science and art, history and archaeology. And so this was a dream of mine a long time ago. COVID came along. I thought, we can't do this. But we finally have achieved it, and I am very pleased with this exhibition. And I hope you will be, too. I am very grateful to those who have supported this show, both materially, financially, and with their great, the great design team that we had. So you will see in this show various themes. This one, the first one being hippotrophia, the raising, nurture, and training of horses which features vases. We even have bronze, a bronze bridle dedicated on the Acropolis. And what I think is also unique about this exhibition is that every object has an, most every object has an archeological context. It was either dedicated on the Acropolis, found in graves in the Karamaikas, or um, uh, down the wells in the Agora. So there are many pieces from various museums uh, in, uh, in Athens also Brow Run and other places. Um, we also have some beautiful marble pieces seen here for the first time. Uh, on the upper left there, you see a uh, marble Lutrophorus with a very complex Calvary scene. You should look closely at this there. Really, it's the most complex. It has five figures on it. Um, and we do not have the Parthenon frieze, in spite of what you see on the lower right, that's a cast from the West frieze. But if you think about the Athenians' love of horses, I think it is manifested most um, beautifully on the Parthenon, where there are over 270 carved horses in marble. So this exhibition, um, as I say, was sort of a dream come true, and um, I hope you uh, will enjoy it. Somewhat belatedly, I realized that there was one horse, probably the most famous horse sculpture in the world, <laughs> that I might possibly have the chance of borrowing. And with great generosity, the director of the Florence Archaeological Museum, Dr. Mario Iozzo, agreed to lend the Medici Riccardi horse 
which dates back to the 15th century AD and was famously in the collection of Lorenzo de' Medici. He's going to tell you, I'm not going to give away anything about this horse, <laughs> but um, I do want to say that Mario has been extremely generous to Greece. Uh, he lent for the first time to Greece the Francois Vaz in an exhibition in the Cycladic Museum, and now this masterpiece, this of, of Greek sculpture. He um, is a bit of an expert on horses because he has uh, published some very interesting articles. He's adept at finding uh, inscriptions that, and features that no one else has ever seen before. He gave a lecture here a couple years ago on um, a, a inscription underneath the glaze, which no one, which he managed to discover. He's also discovered little details on horses painted by Athenian vase painters um, that no one else has noticed. He's published voluminously in the area of Greek uh, vase painting, three volumes for the Asterita collection, the wonderful handbook of all the along with uh, Denoyel of the Louvre, of all the uh, pottery found in the Greek colonies of southern Italy and Sicily. He's also done great exhibitions of bronzes. My favorite title is the Piccoli Grandi Bronzi, the little big bronzes. <laughs> um, and he is uh, going to speak to us tonight on this marvelous edition, this centerpiece, the star of the show, the Medici Riccardi bronze horsehead. Um, and there is the title of his lecture, but I'm going to show you one little amazing thing that I saw. I had the privilege of going to Florence, and on the upper story of the museum, they have installed the most beautiful long, long corridor filled with bright showcases that show the gem collection of the Medici, um, which he, was, he and his colleagues were uh, involved in. So i I just show you one of them. This was um, how they repaired <laughs> gems in the, in the Renaissance by adding these gold uh, additions to the original ancient cameo. Anyway, just one of many beautiful things in that museum, and I hope if you go to Florence, you'll make a point of visiting. So now I will turn this over to Mario Yotso, who will speak on the horse head. Mario. Thank you, Jennifer, and the American School of Classical Studies for kind invitation. I'm generous with Athens because Athens was generous with me. When I was young, I studied here for four years, uh, no break, and uh, that was one of the best period of my life, and I learned so much, and I have so many friends still today, and also Ielada Inedefteri Patridamu. So, the splendid protome, known as the Medici Riccardi horse head, unquestionably ranks among the masterpieces in the collection of the National Archaeological Museum of Florence. Italy's largest archaeological museum north of Rome. Some view of the building, which is a piece of the story in itself. It goes back to Lorenzo il Magnifico. The protome is one, this is the Egyptian section. The protome is one of the very few examples of a life-size bronze animal sculpture to have come down to us from classical Greece. It offers us one of the most significant testimonials of the artistic and technical level achieved by the large bronzes which once adorned ancient cities' public squares and sanctuaries, and which have been destroyed and melted down over the century, centuries to meet the ceaseless demand for metal. Its importance, however, 
lies equally in its singular collecting history, which it would be an understatement to call prestigious, and in the unique role that it played in the history of early Renaissance art. We were recently, recently able to commission the Protomis restoration with the support of, a, of the not-for-profit not -profit Friend of, Friends of Florence Foundation. The restoration, which was performed by Nicola Salvioli, one of the best conservators we have right now in Italy, and a substantial team of chemists and technicians of the Florence National Research Council, also allowed us to reconstruct the Hortz's collecting history in greater detail in the light of the most recent scholarship and of the latest interpretation of the available archive sources. The head is known to have been part of Lorenzo de, Mag de Magnificent's collection, and it is known as the Medici Riccardi head after the celebrated palace designed by Michelozzo for Lorenzo's grandfather, Cosimo the Elder, in 1449-1450, where the bronze spent a part of its post-classical history. Cosimo di Giovanni dei Medici, known as Cosimo the Elder, seen here in an oil painting on tin by Bronzino, was a politician and a banker, a great patron of the arts, and de facto the first lord of Florence, il Signore di, Lorenzo, uh, di Firenze, hence la Signoria, leadership of Florence. He was also the Medici family's first statesman of note and was, nost, was known posthumously as the Pater Patrie, the father of the fatherland. The earliest mention of the horsehead is found in documents listing the property of the Medici family confiscated when its members were exiled in 1494-1495 after Lorenzo the Magnificent's death in 1492. The documents which list the Medici property abandoned by Lorenzo's young son, Piero the Unfortunate, and thus clearly owned by his father, mention una testa di bronzo di cavallo che era nell'orto, a bronze horse head which was in the garden. So, before 1494, the protome stood in the garden of Palazzo Medici, most likely in that part of the garden, facing the, Bas the Basilica of San Lorenzo, rather than in the famous San Marco Sculpture Garden, situated north of the palace, which Lorenzo's wife, Clarice Orsini, this lady here, had purchased and in which Lorenzo had established what is considered the world's oldest academy of art. After the Medici were exiled, the horse head was moved to the Palazzo Vecchio, uh, the municipality, we can say, uh, of Florence, where it was to remain until 1512, when the Medici returned to Florence and restored it to its position in the garden of their palace. This horse has done a lot of galloping here and there. We know for certain that the protome was used, was used as a fountain head in the garden in the 16th century. And indeed, its interior still contains substantial traces of lime scale, uh, not all of which was removed during the restoration of 2015. The decision, <coughs> sorry, the decision to turn the bronze into a hydroroe, water spout, with water spouting out of its upper forelock, this was its position, was apparently made by Lorenzo the Magnificent himself, given that he was the one who decided that it should not be placed in the San Marco Sculpture Garden, i.e. the Academy of Art, 
along with other classical pieces studied and copied by artists of the age, but in the Medici Palace private hortus conclusus, the garden, private garden. Lorenzo de' Medici must have been very interested in horses. In a letter of 1490, he discusses the medical treatment of one of his race horses, and he even owned a manuscript of the Hippiatrica, a 5th and 6th century AD compilation of ancient Greek text, texts, mainly excerpts, dedicated to the care and healing of the horse, purchased for him by the noted Greek scholar Janos Lascaris in Corfu in 1491, and today in the Biblioteca Laurentiana in Florence. On March 28, 1659, by which time the Medici were living in splendor in the Pitti Palace, Grand Duke Ferdinand II sold the old family palace to an extremely wealthy banker named Gabriello Riccardi, who had been the Medici's ambassador to Rome for some years and whom Ferdinando himself had raised to the rank of Marquis. Hence, the current name of this wonderful building, decorated by Luca Giordano's Palazzo Medici Riccardi, decorated by Luca Giordano, with a fresco depicting the apotheosis of the Medici, which entered the new proprietor's ownership along with the horse head. While traveling to Paris and stopping in Florence as a guest of the Riccardi's, in 1665, Gian Lorenzo Bernini was able to admire what he described as that meravigliosa testa e collo di bronzo del cavallo, that marvelous horse's head and neck of a bronze horse. Given that the protomy had been part of an equestrian statue produced by indirect casting, thus with the head and neck cast separately, it had snapped at the seam and the break, and the break uh, had left the lower, the lower profile uh, looking uneven and incomplete. So, in 1672, the Riccardi family commissioned Bartolomeo Cennini, not Cellini, Cennini, to restore the piece. He was a pupil of Pietro Tacca, and an expert bronze smith and, art, and artist who worked with Gian Bologna and with Bernini in St. Peter's in Rome. Cennini pared down the uneven edges of the neck, made good the lacune on the lower edge, and evened out the lower profile, covering it with the ornamental band and scroll that we see today. But more importantly, he repositioned the head on a horizontal plane with the forehead held high in a totally unnatural position, which it maintained until 2015. Gabriello Riccardi placed the head thus restored in the courtyard of his palace at the foot of a heroic statue depicting his illustrious nephew and heir, Francesco Riccardi, the founder of the historic Biblioteca Riccardiana in Florence, uh, historic library, Biblioteca Riccardiana in Florence, and a great friend of Giovanni Francesco Morosini, a well-known name here in Athens. The protomy spent the better part of one, 130 years in that position, until serious financial difficulties forced the Riccardis to sell the palace to Napoleon Bonaparte's niece, Elisa Baciocchi, the Grand Duchess of Tuscany, in 1810. The horse was put on display in the Galleria degli Uffizi in 1815, its exterior receiving a thorough cleaning a few years later, in an effort to remove the lime scale that had formed when it was used as a fountain head. 
This fairly brutal operation was performed with a chisel, which has left clear marks over the entire surface of the protomy. Then, when the House of Savoy founded the Royal Archaeological Museum of Florence in 1870 and later moved it to the Palazzo della Crocetta, the, 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 the actual seat of the museum, uh, the head was tra transferred there and has been there ever since. We don't know for certain when the sculpture entered the Medici collection before 1494. But it, is unquestionably, but it unquestionably served as a model and a source of both formal and stylistic inspiration for the great sculptor Donatello, who made a bronze horse head more than twice its height, is higher than I am, the carafa head, known today as the carafa head, and mentioned in documents since at least 1471. In that year, Diomede de Carafa, the Count of Madaloni from Caserta, a man of letters and a politician at the court of King Alfonso I of Aragon in Naples, sent a letter to Lorenzo the Magnificent to thank him warmly for the large bronze horse head that he had sent him from Florence. Florenzo sent this, head, this Donatello's head to Florence because it didn't belong to him. It was a commission by uh, the, the, the king of Naples, so Lorenzo sent it back to, the, to, the, to, to Naples, even though, meanwhile, Alfonso d'Aragona had already died. The Carafa head is attributed to Donatello by various sources in the 16th century. But Giorgio Vasari tells us in the 1550 edition of his Lives of the Artists, that the head was of ancient origin. origin. In other words, a genuine classical piece. He was to correct himself, however, in 1568, in the second edition of his Lives, this time attributing the Carafa head to Donato di Niccolò di Betto Bardi, i.d. Donatello, and explaining that it was so fine that many had believed that it was an original classical work. Yet for all Vasari's and other sources claim, the attribution of the Naples head so enthusiastically praised by Goethe in his travels of 1787 swung between antiquity and Donatello for centuries. It was not until the, the late 19th century that all doubt was dispelled with the discovery of the letter in which Diomede Carafa thanks Lorenzo the Magnificent and mentions Donatello in that connection. Everyone thenceforth acknowledged the undeniable affinity uh, with the Medici Riccardi hordes, from which Donatello had taken his inspiration. So we can now date, date the presence of the classical bronze in the Medici collections no longer to 1494, but back to at least 1471. Here are the two sculptures, uh, together again after over 500 years, on display at an exhibition on the springtime of the Renaissance in the Palazzo Strozzi in Florence some years ago. Donatello, however, died in 1466. So that takes us back another five years compared to 1471. And we can argue that the head was in Florence from the time of Lorenzo's father, Piero de Gauti, at least. But there is more. <clears throat> Various sources of the period attribute the Carafa head to an unfinished equestrian monument, monument, a large bronze which Donatello was preparing for Alfonso V of Aragon, King of Naples. A drawing by Pisanello 
reveals that the monument was intended to adorn the too light triumphal arch leading into his Castel Nuovo in Naples, a fortress known today as the Maschio Angioino or the Angevin Keep. It, it has also been plausibly argued recently that the, the bronze monument commissioned from Donatello was the work for which the, the wealthy Florentine merchant Bartolomeo Serragli, Alfonso V's agent in Tuscany, paid Donatello a certain sum as early as 1456. Thus, under Cosimo the Elder. The following year, 1457, Donatello moved to Siena to work on another commission and only returned in Florence in 1459 or shortly thereafter. In the meantime, however, both Alfonso of Aragon, the patron, and Bartolomeo de Serragli, the paymaster, had died. This may well explain why Donatello failed to resume work on the equestrian monument, I did chiefly because he, had, he no longer had funding for the bronze or any of his other expenses, and so the Carafa head never received his body. Thus, the head, the Carafa head, remained in Florence and somehow ended up in the Medici collection. In 1466, with, with peace having been restored in Naples after the clash between the houses of Angio and Aragon came to the end, Lorenzo the Magnificent paid a visit to the court of King Ferdinand I, Alfonso's son, King of Naples. While there, he is bound to have seen the empty archways over the door leading into the Castel Nuovo, and this may well have been what prompted his decision to restore the large bronze head that Alfonso V had commissioned from Donatello to Naples. So he sent the protome to his good friend Diomede Carafa, Alfonso V's roistering companion, his representative at the Florentine court, and a counselor at that time to Alfonso's son, Ferdinand I, the new king of Naples, hence the name Carafa Head. So, Lorenzo sent Donatello's bronze to Carafa, who placed it on the right-hand facade of his palace courtyard, exactly in the same position where he had seen the Florentine protome placed in the courtyard of the Medici Palace in Florence. Even though the court of Naples had paid Donatello for the head, it was still part of an unfinished monument. And the initial plan to place the equestrian statue in the triumphal arch leading into the Maschio Angioino had been abandoned by that time in any case. This probably explains why Lorenzo didn't send the work directly to the king, but to his counselor as a private gift without any formality attached to it. Had it been a gift from Lorenzo the Magnificent to the King of Naples, it would undoubtedly have been accompanied by an official act or deed by some document, and the fact would certainly have been recorded in one or both courts. Now, aside from any political and historical interpretation of events, in chronological terms, the presence in the Medici collection in Florence of the Medici Riccardi Prodomi, which served as a model for Donatello's Carafa head, uh, must date back, as we have seen, at least to 1456, i.e. before Donatello departed for Siena. So we can now no longer date it to the age of Lorenzo the Magnificent, as has been generally thought either to, or even to that of his father, Piero de Gauti, but to the final years of, his, of Lorenzo's grandfather, Cosimo the Elder's governance. 
Yet art historians also highlight similarities between the Medici Riccardi head and the horse head on an equestrian monument to Erasmo Danarni, ta Erasmica, erota xerete, eh? uh, known as Gatta Melata, which Donatello modeled in Padua between 1446 and 1453. It hardly needs to be said that Donatello must have observed and studied the Medici Riccardi head before he left for Padua in 1443. So that pushes us even farther back in the time, to the very heart of the age of Cosimo the Elder. In other words, the man who, who first began to assemble the Medici's prestigious collection, collection of antiquities, or better, of Greek antiquities, which over time was to become and long to remain the largest private collection of ancient and contemporary art in the world, second only to that of the popes, although this was not a private collection. Those of the popes are, it belongs to the church. Getting back to horses. The Renaissance heard, had displaced Donatello's characteristic sprezzatura, a kind of clear yet balanced simplification which at times has an almost impressionistic quality to it, and which can be explained in this instance uh, by the fact that the horse was designed to be seen from below and at the very high position, from afar. The Greek head, on the, other, on the other hand, shows a greater yet more delicate anatomical realism. And once upon a time, it must also have been decked with a harness and its attendant rosettes or falere, where the bridle strap cross, but of which only traces have survived. Uh, see, the, see this comparison with the horse ridden by Marcus Aurelius, although Greek harness was undoubtedly smaller and less showy than the Roman version. Uh, this is a hypothetical reconstruction of the harness based on the traces that suggest the presence of a nose band, a brow band, a headpiece, rosettes or falere, uh, where the bridle straps cross, a, a corp chain, and a chin strap. Nicola Salvioli, who performed the meticulous and balanced restoration, also happens to be an expert in the field of horses. Uh, his study has demonstrated that our protomy was part of an equestrian monument, thus not of a four-horse chariot, as some scholars had previously surmised on the strength of a comparison with the horses of San Mark in Venice, but of a single horseman. And this horseman was holding his eager destrier in check. I use the word destrier because we can, stallion, we can tell that the animal was clearly a stallion from the massive neck, the masseter muscle, the dilated nostrils and the throbbing blood-filled surface veins. Yet the fact that he is not at all long in the, in the tooth tells us that we are looking here at the young stallion. He is being restrained by his rider who is pulling the reins ever so slightly to the left barely shifting, shifting the bit and thus accentuating the folds on the corresponding side. There are three labial folds on the left-hand side where the bit is pulling, while there are only two on the right side hand. And the folds of the on the neck behind the masseter's muscle are more developed in an upward direction than those on the opposite side. The horse is not only young, he is also thin, as you can see both from the folds beneath the neck, uh, which are tight and numerous, and from the limited amounts of fat 
on the fat layer, layer immediately below his mane. That is precisely the point where a horse is generally tested for fat. Two fingers grasping the neck and moving it left and right to check the thickness of the layer of fat below the skin. So our horse is in fine metal because he is young and well trained with no trace of excess fat. All that is left of the eyes, which were inlaid in a different material, possibly marble or ivory for the whites and glass paste or colored stone for the iris, are empty sockets. Yet, in addition to the overall anatomy of the head, which is well structured and absolutely realistic, we can appreciate the detailed anatomy of the mouth with the tongue modeled separately and apply it between the horse's played teeth. The ears with their inner fur along the edges, the accurate conformation of the eye, the handling of the coat and veins, and the forelock tied in an upright position. Equally meticulous is the treatment of the short roached mane with tufts showing evidence of regrowth on each side at the base decreasing in size from the nape upwards. The roached mane, incidentally, is another indication that our beast is a young, a young war horse. The Medici Riccardi prodomy has been variously dated over the years from the Macedonian era to the Hellenistic age and even, even to the heart of the Roman imperial era thus ranging anywhere from the 4th century BC to the 2nd century AD. The head, according to me, differs stylistically from the 5th century Greek horse heads, for instance, from those of the Parthenon, both on the pediments and in the frieze, depicting young men galloping, galloping in celebration of goddess Athena at the Panathenaic festivities, festivities, and in my view, it is also different from this Greek world work uh, in the Musei Capitolini in Rome, dated to the late 5th century. I'm not totally convinced of this, but I give you the official chronology. But at the same time, it is also substantially different from the horses of the Hellenistic age, such as the celebrated horse with its rider from Cape Artemision, or from the funerary relief that may belong to Mithridates VI, king of Pontus, carved in the first century BC, both of which are here in Athens. For the Roman era, I shall, rap I shall rapidly show you a few potential comparisons which reveal profound stylistic differences with our horse head. In recent years, on the other hand, the Medici Riccardi head has more probably been compared with monuments of the late classical age. In other words, the late, the, the fourth century BC, both with those from the first half of the century, such as the stele of the warrior Dexileus, who was slain in the war between Athens and Corinth in 394-93, and above all, with those from the second half of the fourth century, such as the so-called called sarcophagus of Alexander the Great, now in the museum in Istanbul, the tomb of uh, Abdalonimos, king of South. Um, a late classical or early Hellenistic date between 340 and 320 BC is borne out by the results of recent analysis of the alloys used in it, which are comparable with those found in examples from the second half of the fourth century BC. And the same is true of the lofty quality and technical skill deploy, deployed in the making of it, along with such technical details as the fact that the main is part of the same casting as the head, 
rather than being cast separately, separately and later inserted into the head. This is the way the Romans were later to do that. The recent restoration has also revealed another decisive clue allowing us to get the work into proper perspective. The bronze is definitely known to have been gilded and contrary to received wisdom either too, the new analysis using a scanning electronic microscope and energy dispersive spectrometry have shown that it was gilded from the outset, which also points to the quality level of the monument to which it belonged. And that it was only gilded wine, once, not twice. Someone had this idea. It used to be thought that it was simply patinated bronze at first, and that it was only gilded in the Roman period, possibly for reuse. The body was fire gilded. Excuse me, that was another, another possible comparison for the fourth century. Yeah, uh, the body was fire gilded and using a pressure process, not with mercury amalgam or glue, with, with, uh, but with uh, the, the amalgam is something that develops in the Hellenistic uh, time, but with thin strips applied using heat and mechanical means, a typically Greek technique and one that is consistent with time frame. The term strip is used in gilding, however. We should not imagine a strip as thick as the bronze variety, but rather strips a few microns, thicker than gold leaf, just slightly thicker than gold leaf, um, but still almost impalpable. Gold leaf, on the other hand, was used for the tricky area inside the ears with its myriad undercuts and jagged edges. And this was a truly innovative technique for, technique for this period. The most recent scholarship dating its first appearance to precisely the fourth century BC. Thus, our head must be one of the oldest examples of this technique. The protomus gilding consisted of a very thin layer of varying thickness, traces of which have been found in various areas, chiefly, uh, of course, in the folds and on the least exposed surfaces. Over some 2,360 years, over 1,000 of which it spent buried in the, in the earth, the gold must have interacted also in electromagnetic terms with the copper of the underlying alloy. And so the gilding bega began to weaken. It began to lose its grip and to lift slightly, allowing corrosion to infiltrate beneath it in certain areas. It was this detail observed in 1990s with the tools of that time that prompted the conclusion that that, that it was a second patina applied in gold leaf in the Roman era, but this was wrong. However, today, in fact, we are in a position to correct this conclusion. Another surprising discovery, which at this juncture confirmed beyond all doubt that the Medici Riccardi has was modeled and cast in the Greek era and in the Greek environment, perhaps in Magna Grecia, we will see, is that at the top of the neck, on one side, at the base of the mane, in a point where it could not be seen because, uh, because of the horse's height, there is an inscription in Greek. Three slender, cold engraved letters, three centimeters height, lambda, ni, he, or, well, he, ni, lambda, which had escaped everyone's notice hitherto for almost six centuries. It is not yet clear exactly what these three letters stand for, though I would be inclined to rule out initials, a signature or anything uh, like of this kind, according, not according to me. They are probably some form of technical indication, and if that is what they are, 
then they must be Greek numerals written using the alphanumeric Ionic system, which was adopted in the course of the 5th century BC. Became fairly widespread in the 4th and had cornered the market by the Hellenistic time. So we are looking at three letters with a numerical value rather than a three number signs. And this system is the only one to contain ni with the numerical value. In the Ionian system, the position of the numbers was based on a decimal criterion with decreasing values. Thus, for example, in the numbers 283, two is the highest value, the hundreds, eight is the tenths, and three is the, like today, um, the unit. In our case, he is the highest value because it stands for 600, followed by, followed by ni, which stands for 50, and by lambda, which is the initial of litra. So the inscription is retrograde from, from right to left and stands for 650 litrae. The litra was a unit of measurement used in the Greek colonies in Sicily and Magna Grecia, initially in silver with a value equal to one-fifth of a drachma, but in the fourth century, it had become a specific unit for the value weight of bronze with a value of roughly 109 grams. Thus, 50, uh, uh, rough 109 grams, a Siciliot litre, times 650, the number engraved, equals about 70 kilos and 80, uh, 850 grams of bronze. The protobi today weighs almost 70. 69 and 300, with this very small difference. In making the calculation, however, we need to take various things into account. While Cennini's addition may have slightly increased the protomy's weight with the addition of the band, we also know that he cut certain part away because in all likelihood, the neck was a little longer than the way we see it today. Also, we are missing the final bulge on the mains forelock, which must have weighed at least 500 grams, misokilo. The harness with all the falere and the eyes. So, I believe that this hidden number, so lightly engraved on the neck of the Medici Riccardi horse, is in fact a reference to its weight, designed to provide practical information for the person tasked with raising the head in order to join it to the, to the horse's body with ropes, pulleys, and other equipment uh, that demanded careful preemptive calculation. Confirmation of this may be seen in the fact that engraving was probably performed prior to gilding, which was naturally the final phase of the process after the figure of the horse had been reassembled, but before its final completion with the figure of the rider uh, being placed on it. Thus, the inscription must have been applied while the head was still in the process of being made, shifted or assembled. Uh, in other words, in a phase in which an indication of the weight on the, indivi on the individual component part would make life considerably easier for the next craftsman uh, in the chain. Observation under the microscope appears to point to just such a situation, namely that the characters were engraved, engraved prior to gilding, but unfortunately, the condition of the surface doesn't permit us to draw a definitive conclusion. An alternative hypothesis might be that at some point in its life, the head which had snapped and become detached from the rest of the body and may already have lost its gilding, maybe, perhaps, become just a piece of bronze, weighing some 70 kilo or so, for use in another cast, ready to be used in another cast, or 
a lump of metal weighing 650 liter, li litri to be put up for sale, for example. In either case, however, the engraving seems to be too neat to be quite a knot dashed for the foundry man's own use or added to a lump of metal for sale or for use as needed. The inscription is quite um, irregular and with a firm hand. And it seems to me uh, to be even more unlikely that the number 650 may refer to an amount of gold required for the gilding process, a quantity that was obviously calculated with meticulous accuracy that was expensive. If that were the case, the inscription would once again be a technical indication for the craftsman tasked with a final phase in the work process. It is true that one of the 37 bronze tablets discovered in the archive of the sanctuary of, of, um, of, the sanctuary of Olympian Zeus in Locri, Locroi Epizephirioi, um, of which this is only an example, tells us, one of, these, uh, one of these 37 bronze tablets, tells us that it took eight gold minae to gild the shield of one statue of Zeus which was one meter in diameter. Thus, if we calculate the two sides of the shield, the surfaces to be gilded was over one and a half square meters. Multiplying that by eight mina and estimating each mina to be between 500 and 800 grams, that means that some four to 4.6 kilos of gold was required, were required, so we must be talking about gilding with thick strips hammered onto the bronze. It follows that in our case, with the minimal thickness of the gilding that we have discovered, uh, in, uh, over 70 kilos really would be too high a figure, uh, given that we have calculated that far less than half a kilo would have covered the entire statue. In addition to which, information of this kind, the information of an administrative type, is never written on the work itself, but in reports like the tablets. There are other bronze statues. Try to resist, I'm almost finished. <laughs> there are other bronze statues with technical inscriptions. The Greek horse of the Capitoline Museum, dated in the 5th century BC, that I, I have shown you before, has a Roman letter on, and some numerals engraved on its left hand, hind leg, which have been interpreted as an indication linked to the location of the equestrian statue in Rome, perhaps on the Capitoline Hill, when it was transferred to the city, very likely as a booty of war. The same statue also has two more inscriptions, one number 12, sorry, this is another one, one number 12 and a letter C, which appear to be later, probably Middle Ages. And these two probably are technical indications linked to the movement of the statue in the city. A similar inscription linked to the location of the statue is engraved in Roman numerals on the belly of the so-called Hellenistic prince in the Museo delle Terme. More interesting, however, is the letter alpha engraved before casting, therefore in the wax model, under the middle toe of the seated boxer's left foot in the same Museo delle Terme. In fact, uh, sorry, in fact, um, it is believed that this letter, this alpha engraved under one foot, um, is a technical indication useful for recognizing the pertinent part of the aristeros pus, the aristera, uh, when the statue was assembled in some Greek area. In the fourth century BC, the use of the litra as a unit for measuring bronze and the direction of the writing from right to left, and even maybe the cross-shaped shape form of the he, maybe, according to some paleographers, seem to point to the statue 
having been made in Sicily. Or maybe it was Sicilian the one who wrote the inscription, who knows. <laughs> A contention that would appear to be borne out to some extent by the, char the character he in the shape of a small cross, a version found in Greece from the archaic period, about five, 550, up to the middle of the fifth century BC. But which in later times, such as the one that we are looking at, even if it can occasionally sti still be found elsewhere, tends to be especially frequent in the Doric colonies of Sicily like Syracuse, Akragas, uh, Jela, and Selinus. <clears throat> These cities would be excellent candidates for the political climate and lofty artistic and technical environment of a kind to justify such a demanding work as a life sites or slightly larger than life sites equestrian statue in bronze in the second half of the fourth century BC. Syracuse were flourishing colony at the time of Timoleon, while Agrigento in those years witnessed the construction outside its city walls of the sanctuary of Asclepius, here and its reconstruction, and possibly also of the theater discovered in 2016. But so was also Jela, whose grandeur at the time is borne out both by the walls of its fortification also dating back to the time of Timoleon, by its civilian neighborhoods and by its material output. I think Selinunte is probably less likely a candidate because while it was rebuilt by Hermocrates shortly after its destruction by the Carthaginians in 409, it means must have been very limited given uh, given the ongoing nature of the Greco-Punic Wars, and these, even though recent studies have tended slightly to reassess the city's position after its destruction and refoundation. In any event, these are all hypotheses of purely academic interest, because the absence of the archaeological evidence for the Greek colonies in Sicily in later classical period makes it difficult to explore them in any greater depth. Moreover, <clears throat> we are left with a doubt that the work may not have been actually made in Sicily itself, but that the craftsman who engraved the number on it was a native Doric of a Doric Sicily, who may have been working uh, heaven knows where, given that bronze smiths and foundrymen traveled constantly to wherever they were needed, to work on a bronze statue. If that is the case, then it follows that he and his assistants were all from the same place, because the inscription must have been intended to someone who could understand it as easy as he could. So we cannot know whether this confirms the Greek environment in Sicily, or rather and in the environment of a group of Sicilian Greeks working away from home. In conclusion, in view of the happy coincidence of the reconstruction and interpretation of the historical documentation on the one hand, and the data that emerged from recent restoration on the other, we may fairly confident state at this juncture that the Medici Riccardi head was a life size or slightly larger than life size Greek equestrian monument. <clears throat> Cast in bronze using the indirect technique, gilded with thin strips and in certain small areas with gold leaf, mostly the ears. One of the earliest instances of the use of this new technique, and that it was made in the second half, half of the fourth century BC. I would ven ven venture a date sometime between 350 and 340 or 35 BC perhaps in a Sicilian colony. At an unspecific moment, the equestrian statues, statue was broken up and ended up below ground for centuries until it ended up, though we have no idea how, in the collection of Cosimo de Medici's The Elder uh, in Florence from at least uh, 14, 1443 
transformed into a fountain head. It was restored in 1672 by Bartolomeo Cennini, who set it in a horizontal position with its nose facing upwards and applied a band around its base that made it difficult to appreciate its natural anatomical position. This was more vertical and with the nose turned very slightly to the left, a position that this has now finally been able to resume. I uh, thank you very much for your kind attention and see you all at the Hippodrome. That's quite a pedigree <laughs> for a horse. Thank you very much, Mario Yotso. And now, um, just uh, we'll have a very brief presentation of the um, by Dr. Flint Dibble of the uh, work that research that has been done on the horse skeletons. But before he comes up here. I just want to show you one other aspect of the show that was a fun project. Um, we wrote a children's book about a, uh, a hypothetical Greek horse named Avra, uh, but which you can have a look at when it's not quite published yet. It will be published by Melisa Books, but it starts out in the laboratory appropriately enough with someone whose name uh, is Dr. Dibble. <laughs> so. And now we will turn, I will bring um, Flint Dibble up here to say a few words about the horse bones, after which you are invited to a reception uh, downstairs in the uh, in and out of the, um, of the entrance to the building. Um, you can feel free to bring your wine or whatever over, walk across the entrance over to the Macriani Swing where there's some chairs and uh, blankets because it'll be just a slight delay before uh, we can let people into the show and it'll be 12 people at a time there'll be some numbers there so um, if you want to brave the cold and socialize please uh, be our guests and if not come back at another time uh, the exhibition is open five days a week and late on third till 10 o'clock on Thursday night so it'll be open till 10 tonight and now I will turn this over to him. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, my study of these horse skeletons is still ongoing, but I thought it would be good to share a few of the preliminary results to whet your appetite for the show. When I was first asked to study these horse remains by Dr. Krisulaki, I was excited and terrified. Um, one of the reasons I was terrified is most settlements, I normally study settlement animal bones, don't have many horses. The horses are here in red for Greek historical period settlements. And so I've not really studied many horse bones before I had this opportunity. The few I'd seen have been butchered for meat or sawn off to create bone implements. We have some examples in the exhibit of those. Um, from a bone working workshop in Athens. And so in this sense, this group of horses is very much a unique find. We don't find many horses in a fairly complete state in the Greek world. And so it's extremely exciting to be able to study this material and to start thinking about what it says. And so I want to just give a big uh, thank you to the Fallero Delta project that did such a, an amazing job excavating this material um, as you can see, some of it's fragmentary, um, others are more complete, they're all varied. 
but I have a few preliminary results just to share to give you a sense of what you can look at when you go into the show and you're confronted with some of these bones. Um, and what I want you to be thinking about is that very much this is a human story. It's easy to see that when we hear about the history and the provenance of this beautiful bronze head. It's very much a human story that we're hearing about. When we think about the Parthenon marbles, we think about Athenians and Athenian identity. And so we're very comfortable thinking about the artwork on display as a human story. So I think it's important to think about these bones as well as a human story, because that's really what they are. As a zooarchaeologist, I'm not a biologist. Instead, I'm looking at how humans and their interaction with these um, magnificent horses. Um, so what is the human story behind these burials at Phaleron? Is that they are very carefully selected horses that are buried there. This is not giving us a full picture of Athenian horses or horses at Phaleron. Instead, almost all of the horses are male. We can tell that from the presence of large canine teeth. And at the same time, almost all of the horses are young, four to six years old. And so this is a very careful selection of horses for burial here. When we think of, for example, a buried horse, we like to imagine that this is a, a pet, a favorite horse, a member of somebody's family. But this is clearly not horses that died of old age. They were selected probably for sacrifice and buried there. At the same time, I noticed a very unusual trend. I found two bones with cut marks on them. Right here is one on a thigh bone. And they both come from this horse, one at the hip and one at the shoulder. And so clearly this is not butchered for meat. It's coming from a complete skeleton. And so it, it's funny, when, when Dr. Krizulaki first asked me what I might discover from this study, she suggested maybe these horses were posed. And I said, I don't think as a zooarchaeologist I can really answer that question. That's a question of context, um, burial context. But with these two cut marks, I think we have evidence from the bones themselves that they were displayed in a specific pose. And the, the, the muscles were tight, the tendons were tight, so they had to cut into it in this example to be able to position it with the back leg extended and the front leg contracted. And we can see this pattern through several of the burials across the site that most of them that we have a complete or largely complete horse have these back legs extended and the front legs contracted. And with this one, Jennifer noticed one day from a photo I had hanging up how the tail sticks straight out. So it's as if they're in motion. Um, and so they were carefully displayed in their graves before burial. And so I also want to just highlight the human side of the study. Uh, what we do as archaeologists is very, very human-based. And I really want to thank everybody that has helped me out. Um, in particular, Stella Krisolaki and the Fali Road Delta team, but also Jennifer Niles, Takis Karkanis, the Wiener Lab staff, and the, uh, the Falaron Bioarchaeological staff. And most importantly, all my students and volunteers. I had volunteers from seven different countries, including several Greeks and Americans and from all over that came in to help me clean the sand off these bones. And so this was a big job. And I might have had humans on my brain a little too much the first time I laid out one of these horses. And I sent this photograph to Jennifer, and she's like, are you really a zooarchaeologist? Are you the right person to be studying this material? And, uh, but in the end, I think we got it right. And so I hope you can all enjoy this and uh, uh, the exhibit and everything. So thank you.